So our topic this morning is, uh, we find that in salvation. Uh, salvation is found in no one else. Uh, there is no other name under heaven given. There's no other name under heaven that's given to men by which we are saved. So this morning we're talking about salvation. And then the question that comes from behind that is, uh, what are we saved from? What are we saved from? So when we have salvation this morning, the question is, what are we saved from? Yeah. And so the answer with, to that question would be, anybody? Sin. What are we saved from? Sin. Thank you. Ah. We're saved from sin. Um, exactly. So then the question is, what is sin? Can somebody tell me what sin is? Something that separates us from God. Okay, thank you. And a lot of times we define sin as transgression of the, of the law. First John 3, 4 says, sin is transgression of the law. So I, I, let me just put it this way. I'll throw up something here so you guys can get a uh, a greater understanding of this. Um, okay. So what is sin? Answer. Sin is disobedience well, against go. God's perfect law by failing to do what God commands or doing what God forbids. So how many of us actually agree that this is sin? Sin is disobedience against God's perfect law by failing to do what God commands or doing what God forbids. How many of us are in agreement with Sin is disobedience against God's perfect law by failing to do what God commands or do. Okay. Everybody seems to be there. Okay. Now, so can somebody tell me what's the opposite of sin? The opposite of sin. Yeah, this one. That's. Oh, straight up. Yeah, that's why. Right. <laughs> no. Obedience? Oh. That's what went off the other side. Like, nah. The opposite of sin is righteousness. Thank you. You're yeah. welcome. The opposite of sin is righteousness. Now, let me ask you something. If the opposite of sin is righteousness, then all we have to do is what? I wonder if they can hear us. If sin is disobedience, then all we have to do is to get righteous is what? Obey. Obey. Okay, now here's the thing. Does anybody understand what this word is? Legalism. Does Sistek understand what the word legalism means? Anyone? Unmute. Let me know. What is legalism? Anybody? No. No? I'll give you a different. I'll give you a little bit of definition of what legalism is. See what you think. Okay, legalism is strictly literal, often too strict or excessive conformity to the law, or to a religious moral code. That's what Webster says. Strict adherence to law, especially to the letter rather than the spirit. That's what Random House says. So let me ask you: Are you a legalist? Is Sistek a legalist? This definition, you can go and find it, and not only there, but you can find it in uh, Wikipedia. It says the same thing. Wikipedia says this here. Uh, salvation, practice to believe in order to achieve salvation and the right standing before God. Okay? Anyone who's trying to perform certain deeds in order to gain salvation, as opposed to a belief in salvation through grace. So anyway, so this is uh, you find that in legal in theology, then you also have legal definition is legalism exists when 
people attempt. Okay, let me, excuse me, I'm just trying to get people in. Uh, legalism exists when people attempt to secure righteousness in God's sight by works. A legalist believes that they can earn or merit God's approval by performing requirements of the law. This is by Thomas S. Schreiner, who rewrote and followed up on what Martin Luther King, he is actually a New Testament scholar. He's a New Testament uh, professor. He says a legalist believes that their good works and obedience to God affects their salvation. Legalism focuses on God's law more than relationship with God. It keeps external laws without submitting to the heart. So when you look at legalism, they have, they have the tendency to be more of a lie than truth. So the question is, are you a legalist? Are we legally? Okay. Uh, have you ever heard people call you a legalist? Okay. Now let me just share with us. This is what legalism is. Legalism is in, in just in the... Just, uh, here in the relationship. When you push one way or the other, are you a legalist in the rules? Or are you out? Are you here? Lawlessness, we have a tendency to look at it either way. Relationship, and I think a lot of times we look at Sunday people, they have a relationship, but they don't follow the rules. But they look at some of the people here, you guys have too much rules, but don't have relationship. But the reality is, where are we? Are we here? Are we here? This is where we should be. Rules and regulations, or are you here? So this is what we're talking about this morning. What is legalism? But see, that comes all back to how we define the word, what is sin? So the question is, what is sin? And, and then there's the, the true meaning of the word sin is called missing the mark. It comes from the Hebrew word chatawa, and then also comes from the Greek word hamarati. What it says is the word which is the law, comes from the root word yara, meaning to shoot an arrow or hit the mark. So if sin is missing the mark and the arrow is shot and it misses the mark and the word Torah means the law, so that means that the sinner here is the law and if you shoot the arrow and you miss, then you are in sin. So that's the way uh, Judaism or they have the tendency to look at that way. That's why they were called legalists because they were conforming to specific laws in order that they can be saved. But is that what the Bible says? Is that what the Bible means by uh, strict adherence? We are not legalists. We don't, we don't keep a law in order to be saved. So just remember that. So I'm going to share with you what I mean. What's in the middle here? Is it the law? I don't believe it's the law. I believe right in the middle here, is none other than uh, Jesus himself. Jesus is the one that's right in the center of that bullseye. Even though they think it's the law, but I believe it's Jesus and not. If we're missing that mark, we're missing Jesus, not the law. Let, let's go on further. So what is sin? Uh, so the question is, what is sin? Before we continue, is there a difference between sin and sins? Does anybody see a difference between sin and sin? This could be this could be the difference between the crack in the road, the crack in the sidewalk, and a big gap 
in the road. Your understanding of difference between sin and sins. Now, for those, what is the difference between sin and sins? Does anybody can tell me what the difference between sin and sins is right now? Just looking at it. Sin, some say it's singular. Sins, some say it's plural, but let me just uh, open it up a little further for you so you can uh, if you have any question just uh, unmute and just ask your question because I can't see you because of the, the thing here it's the instant behind the last one that become blue. I believe that yes go ahead I believe sin and sins is uh, we're born into sin and sins are the sins that we do. Amen. So, Thank you, Gary. You're man. You're a true theologian. Let me just. Uh, I think this is what Gary's talking about. Sin singular is the principle. Sins plural is the X. Sin singular is the root. Sins plural is the fruits. Sin singular is the cause. Sins plural. Is the result. Sin singular is the realm. Sin's plural is the deeds. Sin singular is the master. Sin's plural is the service. For those who know, now you guys kind of get a good idea of what sin and sins are. Now let's let's take a look at uh, all the texts. Now here there are five texts in the Bible that actually tells us what sin is. And our first text is, we all know, for sin is a transgression of the law. The second text is James 4, 17. Therefore, to him that knoweth to do good and doeth not, to him it is a sin. Now, this second commandment is really something that has to do with a particular, uh, that means it has, it's, it's singular in a sense where it's, it says, for him that knows to do good and doeth not, to him it is a sin. It's not a sin to everybody because a person next to you may not know what is what you're thinking. But if you know what to do good, that is a sin unto you. Not a sin to everyone if you know what it is to do good. Right, let's go to verse 3. The third text is 1 John 5, 17. It says this. Hold up. Let me try to get everybody in. Thank you. So John 5, 17 says, you got clean hands. All unrighteousness clean is hands. sin. Oh, yeah. And then John 16, 9 said, of sin because they believe not on me. So it's a sin not to believe. It's a sin not to believe. And then Romans 14, 23 says, it is Whatever is not a faith is a sin. So it's a sin not to have faith. Now, is there a difference between belief and faith? Does anybody, can somebody share with me? Just unmute and just share with me. Does anybody know the difference between belief and faith? Are they the same? Are they different? Okay. Uh, can. Sin, because they believe not. The difference between sin is <coughs> not believing is that uh, I'll, I'll further that down the line. I'm going to explain that further. They, they, there's, a, there's a slight difference between belief and faith. The Greek words are pisteo and pistis, but we're going to go further down. But just understand this. This is a five text that tells us what sin is in the Bible. Now, if you take all these definitions right here, transgression of the law, no to do good and do it not, all unrighteousness of sin, they believe not, faith, you come to one, you come to one conclusion. You come to one definition of what sin singular is. What is that conclusion? Sin singular is living life apart from God. That's it. 
So sin singular is living life apart from God. Now, is this an old? Is this something that I'm that that we just started to understand? Is this something that I'm trying to make up? No, it's not. It's actually you find that in the Old Testament. Now, if you look in the Old Testament, the Old Testament says, "Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened, that it cannot save, nor his ear heavy, that it cannot hear." But your iniquities or your sins have separated you from your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear you. So this is the Old Testament. But in the New Testament, we're now going to break it down so he can understand a little bit further. So here's the question. Is sin a state of being or a behavior? Hmm. Is sin a state of being or a behavior? And this is one of the questions that we're asking. Is it a state of being? Or is it a behavior? Let me just share with you what it what it actually is. Sin, the state of being, leads to sins, your behavior. So are you with me? Sin is a state of, of who we are. It's our nature. We're living in what you call a sinful nature. That leads to our behavior, sinfulness. What we do <coughs> to our behavior. Now let me ask Please you something. This device. Excuse um, me. I knew you got to go to my. Bye. So if we were to reverse that, if we were to put. Now look, this is sin. It leads to your behavior. Now look at what salvation does. Same thing, but we're going to put salvation here. Okay, I'll come back to it. See, sin and sins are not the same results of sin singular i think we have already covered that so sins singular is the cause sins plural is the results so again since living life apart from god leads to doing all the wrong things since so this is basically what it's saying is living life apart from god uh, we're going to go back to our sin here. Now, let me ask you something. Transgression of the law, is it a, a state of being or is it a behavior? It's more of a behavior. Behavior. Correct. The second one, know it to do good and do it not. Is that a state of being or a behavior? Yes, it's a behavior. Good behavior. First John 17, all unrighteousness, all unrighteousness. Is that a state of being or a behavior? It's a behavior. Behavior. Now look at John 16, where sin and believe. When you don't believe, it's not a behavior, it's a state of being. And so is faith. It's the state of being. Okay? Now you guys see the differences. Now I'm going to readjust it so you can actually see from the five texts what these five texts are trying to tell us. It says, the state of being or relating leads to our behavior. Sin, singular, leads to sins, plural. Because we live life apart from God, when we live life apart from God, we don't believe, we don't have faith. That leads to transgression of the law. It leads to every time you know what to do good and you don't do it, you automatically do it. And all the unrighteousness, you, doesn't matter what you call it, <coughs> all the things you do, that results in your behavior. So here is the cause, here is the result. And let me ask you something. How many of us work on behavior? Well, if you work on your behavior, then you become what they call a legalist. You're trying to work on behavior in order that you can... I'll cover that later in a little bit. So lead 
into behavior. Remember I told you the state of being leads to sins, your behavior. Now I'm just going to readjust this a little bit so you can understand. Now if we were to put salvation in there, this is what it would look like. Salvation is a state of being. It leads to righteousness, your behavior. We're saved by Jesus Christ, first and foremost. And why do we keep the Sabbath? Why do we keep the law? Why don't we kill our neighbor? It's because of who we are. We do those things because we are saved, not in order to be saved. That's why I'm saying we're not a legalist. We're right in the middle where the law and relationship comes in place. When you can understand where relationship comes in and you can understand where the law comes in, you have no problem. So the state, like I said, before a sin is a state of being that leads to all your sins, your behavior, all the bad things you do. And so is salvation. Salvation is the same thing. Salvation is a state of being that leads to your behavior, which is your righteousness. This is what we call righteousness by faith. <clears throat> now you got to understand which leads to the other. Behavior do not lead to salvation. And I think a lot of people have been trying to do that. They're trying to behave a certain way in order to gain salvation. That's illegalist. What God said is being saved and by spending time with him, that eventually will lead to doing all the right things that need to be done right. That's what righteousness means. Doing what is right. Being right. That's what righteousness means. So as we go out, now let me just, I'm going to expand this thing a little bit further because I know this everybody uses a lot in, and most SDA we use that. Now I'm just going to put in that definition that we have, living life apart from God. And I want you to see the dynamics, the greater dynamics says, whosoever committed sin, transgression also the law for sin is a transgression of the law. And I'm going to add in there the definition of what we came with this morning. Whosoever committed living life apart from God. Now, I want you to read this. Whoever committed living life apart from God transgresses also. Like Now, the key text is also. If you're living life apart from God, it says, you are transgressed also the law. For it says, living sin, living life apart from God is transgression of the law. What does that mean? That means that all you have to do is live life apart from God and you already transgression the law. Are you with me? You don't have to break the law per se. All you have to do is live life apart from God. You're already living in transgression. Because a lot of people say, well, if it was an ax, it's not about the ax. It is important. It is, please, uh, please don't get me wrong this morning. Our behavior is very much important. But you got to know how our behavior comes. It comes from a relationship. Now, someone asked me, <clears throat> what about atheists? See, an atheist, somebody that don't believe in God, he could give money. He could bake a cake for his neighbor. He can mow his neighbor's lawn. Those are morally good people. But does that make them a Christian? No, it doesn't. They're atheists. They don't believe in God. And so God calls that anyone that lives apart from God is living in sin, singular. And everything else is a result. Transgression. Now I'm going to do it in Samoan so you guys can understand it in Samoan for those Samoans who are joining in this morning. Now I'm going to just add that definition this morning. If you go to the Samoan, it's even more uh, definite that 
have to uh, break the law per se. Just living apart from God, you're breaking the law. Now let me let me just bring it in. I'm going to bring it into another. I'm going to add another dimension to this this morning of the same principle. Now the principle there's two principles of the law. It says, "Love the Lord with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind." And the second part of the principle is, "Love the Lord with all thy love thy thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself." So two things. The first principle is love the God and loving man. See, these are the two principles that are founded upon the law of God. But did you know that sin nullifies this law? Let me just share with you from the five texts that we that we talked about this morning. <clears throat> you see, because the law is based out of love. Now, love, if you read if you read the text in uh, Galatians 5 verse 22 they say the fruit of the spirits fruit in that text is singular one fruit and that fruit is love but that fruit of love is expressed in eight different ways you see you see that's what the whole the law is all about the two principles of the law it's about loving loving God and loving man but did you know that that principle of the law is disqualified here. You see, sin, when you transgress the law, you violate the two principles of the law. What two principles? If you don't believe and you don't have faith, that's talking about God. And you know to do good, you don't. That's talking about man. Unrighteous, all unrighteous, talking about myself. These two, the, when you transgress the law, what it says in First John three four, you automatically violate the two principles of the law, which is here, God and man. So whichever way you want to look at it, <clears throat> the five texts of sin actually helps us <clears throat> to understand as what what sin is this morning. That's why I'm saying. Understanding what sin and sins is this morning can really help you in your understanding of how you will relate to God. Okay? Now, let me just give you an example this morning. So here you are with all your sins. Sins is all the bad things you're doing. And here is Jesus. Now, here's sin, singular, which is living life apart from God. This is you and your your bad self. And here's Jesus. So the question is, how do you take sin singular out of your life? Anybody? How do you take sin singular out of your life? This is the only thing that we have a choice is. In order to take sin singular out of your life, all you have to do is to, to take sin singular out of your life. All you have to do is to come to have Jesus come into your heart. Amen. Now you no longer live in sin, singular, but you still got what? Sins. Jesus comes into, we still have all these bad habits. What well, you can call it, drinking, smoking, whatever. You still got all these bad habits. But the more time you spent with Jesus, the more time you die daily, what happens? Jesus starts to grow a little larger. And the more you spend with Jesus, Jesus starts to, to grow larger. And to eventually, when Jesus fully converted you and have sealed you, you see, I don't know where you're at. You're probably here. Some were probably here. Some was probably here. For some, we're probably still here. Some were starly still here, living life apart from God. But Jesus said, you, you, you can take that out of your way. Come to Jesus. No one's perfect. But you know what I'm saying? Did you know, for those who don't know, 
the word saved in the New Testament comes from the Greek word sozo. Now the Greek word sozo has another uh, definition to it. Did you know the word sozo means heal or healing? See, Jesus not only wants to save us, but he wants to heal us completely from all our sins. Did you know that when you get baptized, you have committed yourself and you ask the Holy Spirit, which is representative of Jesus, to come into your life. And now it is the Holy Spirit that helps us to overcome all of our sins. The only thing we need to do is to abide in Christ, is to stay with Jesus. And stay with Jesus, and we must daily die in Jesus. What does that mean? Die. That means the more time we spend with Jesus, the less time we spend in messing around with our sins. And the more we focus, now, and the more we focus on Jesus, the bigger Jesus gets in our life, and eventually Jesus crowds out sins in our life. Now, let me ask, let me tell you something. If you, if you haven't, tra uh, if you have not progressed, I ask you something. Are you focusing on your sins or are you focusing on Jesus? Are you focusing on trying to keep the Sabbath holy? Are you focusing on not doing the right things, not not uh, not stealing, not committing adultery, or are you focusing on Jesus? Now let me share something. When you focus on Jesus, eventually the behavior will come because the behavior is the result of focusing on Jesus. And what is the behavior? The behavior is all the righteous thing. You will do the right thing. And as you do the right thing, sins become less to you because Jesus is bigger in your life until eventually Jesus takes over your life. So this morning, like what I said, salvation is found in no one else but Jesus. So this morning, I just want to, that's that's our lesson this morning. So I'm going to take some questions. If anybody has any questions this morning about our lesson or want to add on something this morning, I want to open it up for anybody that wants to have a question or want to add on this, this morning. This is the time you can ask your question, and I'll try to open it up for questions now. Okay. Anybody have any questions this morning? Anybody have a so just to kind of uh, go back again? I'm gonna go back on something here that uh, there was a point here that I wanted to make sure that you guys understand. It's about le legalism, huh? You, do you remember this? A uh, legalism, and I think uh, this is where we. Because when you go out, the people will call you a legalist. Well, actually, we're not a legalist. We're talking on relationship. And because of our relationship, we automatically keep the rules. Not in order to be saved, but because we are saved. That's how we look at salvation. That's how we look at life. Now, there's a difference in how people look. The lawlessness is the way, most likely, a lot of the Sunday churches... They are from here. They have their relationship. But when they look at us here, they, they don't see us. They actually see us as legalists. Rules without relationship. That's what they look at us. <clears throat> but when we look at, if you're too far to the left, we have, or you're here, we have the tendency to look at them and say, yeah, you guys are not rules. But the question is, if you're a legalist and you're trying to reach out to them, does it disqualify you? Does it disqualify your message? Because you're trying to focus on this. That's why I'm saying the key is here. Knowing how to relate. This is where cis-section is at. Not a legalism, they're not. So with that, 
we, we have the tendency to drift here to the middle, to the side. But when you can understand where you stand, then you know what I'm talking about this morning. So, so this morning, again, I'm opening it up for questions. Anybody has any questions this morning? Uh, anything they want? Okay, anyone? So it's your salvation that makes a difference. If it's salvation that makes a difference, then you got to understand what salvation really means. <clears throat> because like what I said, there's a lot of people that look at us and say, well, you guys are just trying to keep the law in order to be saved. No, we don't keep the law in order to be saved. We keep the law because we are saved. We love to do what needs to be done. We don't do it. We do it from the heart. When you start to struggle in trying to keep the law, if you struggle trying to keep the Sabbath, it's not because you have not spent enough time with Jesus. And wait, it's not because you haven't kept the law correctly. It's because you need to go back to your relationship. How related, how much have you spent time with that? You're like, for me, I don't force myself to go to the Sabbath. I don't try not to kill people. It's part of my being. It's who I am. Well, how do I get there? I get there because I spend a lot of time with Jesus. And by reflecting on Jesus, it reflects in my life. The Bible says, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. That means that we spend more time with God, it automatically reflects. And this is what Jesus really wants. When we keep the law, we do it because we love it. We love to do it. Not because, oh, we have to, I need to go Sabbath, I need to do this, I need to do that. Or I have to do this, I have, you don't have to do anything. That's the thing that Jesus said, you don't have to do anything. But if you have a godly heart as Jesus, then you'll understand what I'm talking about. You do it because you love the Lord. And that's what I'm saying. When the family of God has needs, the people that are in the family of God that understand his will will step up and help the family of God because he is part of that family. He does it from his heart, not out of obligation, but really he does it because of his love. Some do it out of obligation, that's fine. But I, that obligation they feel is because of the love that they have for Christ. So I'm just opening it up. I know we got some time before, got about another 10 minutes before we come to a close. But I'm just trying to stress on us this morning, if you understand your relationship with God. Now, I'll put it another way. <clears throat> sin has been uh, a symbol of, of a very serious virus. And this virus, it ends up in death. That means once we get this virus, death is automatic. And we all know that the sin virus, that's why we're all going to die. <coughs> now, now, if sin virus is a sickness, then we need a physician. And Jesus is our physician. Now, if Jesus is our physician, when we come to him, when we accept him as our physician, that is salvation. Now, here's a question. When you come to him, you find out that he's the only physician that has 100% cure to the sickness that you have. So when you come to him, all the, all the doctor asks you is, they look, come and stay with me. Come, you need to visit me as often as possible so I can make sure that your sickness is going well. Now, as long as you're staying with the doctor, as long as you're staying within the plan that he has, that's what salvation is all about. It, it's and it, listen to this. And he understands us so much that he knows that when you get when after the first visit, he doesn't expect miracles out of you because he knows that sin has done a lot of things to you, has caused a lot of havoc. But he wants to work with you slowly to eventually heal you totally. What that means is. If you went to a doctor and you're on a wheelchair and the doctor's trying to work with you to, to walk, the doctor, the one thing the doctor don't expect you to do is to, as soon as you leave the doctor, to jump out of your wheelchair and start running. No, he doesn't expect that. But he expects you to do what he has asked you to do. Maybe get up every once in a while to do that. Some things he tells you so you can do daily. You come back and the doctor sees you and says, oh, okay. Now, when was the last time you went to a doctor and the doctor gave you a prescription, and the doctor told you to come back. And when you came back, 
you've seen the doctor and you told the doctor, oh, I'm sorry, doctor, I didn't follow the prescription that I gave you. And the doctor goes, oh, now I gotta kill you. No doctor does that. So why do people expect that if you don't do what God's gonna tell you to do, that he's gonna come back, when you come back to him, he's gonna say, I'm gonna kill you. No, God, what God, what the physician Jesus does is say, look, I know it's not easy, but you gotta continue to stay with me. Listen to what I'm saying. Here's what I'm gonna help you. I'm gonna give you my Holy Spirit. I'm gonna help you to go through this thing so he can help you go through it. And the thing is, you got to stay with the program. You can't walk away from the program. The time you walk away from the program, once you start leaving the physician and don't go back to the physician, that's when you got problems. The sickness gets worse. And when it gets worse, you start to see symptoms. What are the symptoms? Breaking the law, not keeping the Sabbath, don't do whatever, whatever, whatever. That is the symptoms of this thing. The reason why we came to Jesus is because we had all these symptoms. And this symptoms is leading us to death. That we're gonna die so that's that's just a, a way you look at it because this sin is a virus that's eventually going to kill us and jesus is the only physician that has a hundred percent cure on this and his blood is a vaccine for us accepting him and the blood that he did on the cross is actually a vaccine for us to overcome our sin virus so this morning i just want to that's another way of looking at it and so what's my whole point this morning when my whole point this morning is when you come to Jesus, son of the vine, you are the branches. Then he reached out and said, you must abide in me. Abide me to come and stay with Jesus. How do you come and stay with Jesus? Spending time with Jesus. Any relationship develops, starts with three things. What are the three things? First, you listen. Second, you speak to them. And third, you do things together. Now, for those who have underheard me talk about this, we, that comes into the holy place. There's three things in there that the priest comes and does every daily, which is the, the showbread, uh, the, the lampstand, and also the, the, arc, the, uh, the incense. It's in the, these three things have three, these have symbolism. But now that we're in the New Testament, in the New Testament, <clears throat> we're all Christian, uh, we're all called priesthood of the believers. What that means is now this holy place is representative of what we do daily. What is that? How do we speak to God? <coughs> through prayer. How do we listen to God? Through studying the Word of God. And through prayer and studying the Word of God, <clears throat> we do what God witnessing in our life so that's the that's the whole point this morning that i'm trying to share with you is that staying with your god if if you're having problems with uh not doing what you need to do maybe it's not because you're not good enough maybe be, spend time with jesus that's all it is spending time with jesus prayer that's all it is the, like what the bible says as a man thinketh and as a man spend time with it, so is he. So this morning's lesson, and I hope that you guys, uh, now I'm just opening it up for the last five, 10 minutes. If anybody has any comments or anything, that anybody has any questions <clears throat> they want to ask, you can ask it now. Just unmute and just ask your question this morning. Um, yes, I have a question, please. Um, sure, go ahead. What does it mean to die in your sins? Um, to die in your sins? Yes. Okay. But see, when the Bible says to die in your sins, okay, that means you have the word to surrender. Right. Okay. It's another way for saying surrender. But you don't surrender. Now, when you're talking about sins, we're talking about all the bad things you do. Am I right? Yes. Okay. Now, follow me. When you're in the war, when two people are, are going at, at the war, okay, when they're having a battle, when one group surrenders, what do they surrender? Their weapons? What's the first thing they surrender? Themselves. The first thing they surrender is self. 
the weapons automatically come as a result of them surrendering themselves. Are you following me this morning? Yes. When the army surrenders, they give themselves up. Automatically, the guns, the tanks, everything else come as a result of that. So what I'm saying is that when you surrender, when you give your life to God, automatically everything else that comes behind that eventually will happen. What that means is if all the bad things you're doing, all God wants to use to die, meaning surrender to Jesus, stay with Jesus, and automatically all the things that you do will eventually be given over, will be given up, be surrendered. Um, Pastor? Okay. Yes. You know, I just want to um, add in what sin does to us. Sin is yes. like a hot stove. The stove does not care what your intention were for touching it. It will still burn yes. you, not because God is punishing you. God does not burn you because you touch a hot stove, but because that's just what sin does. Okay. Yes. And so, and, and, and it brought my, me and mine. Um, what Pastor, Pastor Sally said last week and, and, and that like stuck in my heart this whole week was that um, he who has the son has life and, yes. and, and, and if, if we like stay close with, with God and, and we know in our hearts that if we have God whatever sin, whatever comes our way you know, we have God in us and, yes. and I just want to add my 10 cents to yes. that. Thank you. That makes, that makes really sense. Because uh, that's why the Bible says in First Corinthians that God will not allow you to go through any temptation that you can't handle. That means if God allowed the temptation to come to you, is there's a reason why God allowed the temptation. So that it can help you to overcome. But he never, he, when, he, when that temptation comes, he always gives you a way out. So when you're training yourself, see, God's allowing you because they, if you notice that in the Old Testament, when God gave the people uh, manna, the food to feed them, and what did they want? They always wanted the meat that they had in Egypt. But God gave them manna. And they continue to do that. They still come continue to complain. You know, finally God says, you know what? Okay, I'm going to give you meat, but let, let me tell you what kind of meat to eat just to help you out a little bit. So he gave them a, so that you guys don't get so sick. <coughs> but is it the ideal thing that God wants them? No, it was ideal, but God allowed it because they wanted it so much. But God helps them. Okay, God said, look, if you want meat so much, let me at least show you which one not to eat so you don't get sick so often. And so, but if you really look at it, it's how we see God and how we, if God is an arbitrary God or God is a, is some kind of a God that just wants to, uh, waiting for us to make mistake and then zap us, then we need, really need to think about what kind of God that we have, that we serve. Uh, is it a God, a God of love or is it a God, a God of the vengeful? And, uh, so you need to know how to balance all these things that we describe God to be. So just understanding that will help us out. So with that, anyone else has any questions or something to add on? Thank you, Alita. Um, yes, Pastor. Um, yes, you know, go the, ahead, Gary. The three things you said we, you know, uh, yes. Christian needs to do. So what if you're strong in the two, like um, with yes. the, the praying and maybe the, the reading? Does it have yes. to be balanced? Is those three things you said, is it a must? It's, or how, it, you, how, do we, it, how do we find balance? Yeah, you have to find balance in all of them. And, and the thing is, by spending time with God, God will help you to show you how to balance those things. Because the reality is that you notice that when you learn something, right, by studying the word and you're praying about it, right? And then God says, God allows you to go through a situation where you have to fulfill what you just read, what you just read about. You see what I'm saying? Say like... Uh, Say like I, I love killing people <laughs> where, I, where I used to kill people or whatever. Just an example. I read the Bible said not to kill. <laughs> but then I get into a situation where God is putting me and where I usually kill people. God says, no, you shouldn't be killing people. So that's where I start to make a decision. 
do I do I do this or do I don't? I, I know that was an extreme case. Maybe I should have went something a little bit lesser, but that's kind of an extreme case. Do you kind of make sense, Gary? Or but yeah, how do you bring it to balance? One way. How do you bring it to balance? Yeah, is one yeah. There's one way more than the other. That's what he's trying. No, no, no. To say. Well, I, 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 the way you can know that it's balance is in your own relationship with a marriage. Now, marriage is something that you work at. Now, in marriage, we 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 talk to each other. In marriage, we listen to each other. But what happens when one one overdoes the other? What if one talks too much and the other one doesn't want to listen? You have problems. You're going to have to learn to work with it. What if one doesn't want to listen at all? But what if they listen to each other but don't want to do things together? You're going to have problems. So somewhere between there, in your, even in your relationship at, as a marriage, you have to learn to compromise and to work things out to where you know that all parties in this can work together. And you find out as you go along, it actually harmonizes. It actually makes your family work more closely. And you find out that, hey, it's not as bad as what you think. Does that that kind of helps out a little bit? Thank you, Pastor. Well, if you're not married. <laughs> what if, if you're not married, just just know this. It's how you relate to your parents. It's the same principle. It's how you relate to your parents. There are things that your parents, that you may not like with what your parents are saying, but reality is, because we're young, because we do things, if you listen to your parents, they have wisdom that beyond our, our, our age. What that means is they've been through what we've been through. And if we just sit down and just think about what they're saying, it makes a lot of sense. So you learn to balance that between your parents. You don't want to disrespect them, but you want to respect them. But at the same time, you're listening. And, you know, so it's also, if you may not be married, but you may be single, that's the only example I can give you back is uh, within your own parents or family. Okay. Thank you, Pastor. Okay. There's somebody asked, what if you're forced to keep a Sabbath? <clears throat> now, no, the like, question I ask you, if you're being forced to keep the Sabbath, that, it tells me that you don't want to keep the Sabbath. So my question is, why don't you want to keep the Sabbath? If you're having a problem keeping the Sabbath, that, here's my point, because you're saying, somebody asked, uh, why am I being forced to keep the Sabbath, or if I'm forced to keep the Sabbath? Yes, I can see if you're a parent, this is where you want your child to move to. This is what you want your child to do. But here's the bottom line that I need to tell those who are being forced. If you're being forced, it tells me that you really don't want to go to the Sabbath. And if you really don't want to go to the Sabbath, it tells me that where does your problem lie? Your problem doesn't lie in your parents. Your problem lies is that you really don't know who God is. You really don't know who Jesus is. And because you don't know what Jesus is and God is, then you're having a problem with the Sabbath. Your problem is not between you and your parents, which it is. But your problem, real problem, is between you and God because eventually that problem goes bigger beyond your parents. When your parents pass away, then you got a bigger problem. Does that make sense? So with that, uh, I know it's about uh, almost time over, but anyone else have any other questions before coming to a close this morning? I do a thank you for, I know I probably opened up a more uh, can of words for some of us. Uh, open up a uh, Pandora's box this morning, but uh, if you have any questions, uh, now is the time I can try to at least make sense of it this morning. Hi, Pastor. Anyone else have a me, Pastor Mo? Mo um, first of all, thank you for the beautiful lesson. Um, God bless you. My question, um, not much of a question. I just want you to go through if you can just break it down one more time. What singular? What's the difference between singular and plural mean? Like sins and sins. Sin and what? Sins. Sin and sins. Sins and sins. Yes, please. Okay. Now, uh, I know for those who, I don't know. Okay, let me just break. Okay. Now, sin. Now, there's a difference between sin and sins. Sin is the principle. Sins is the act. Sins is the root. So what I'm saying, sin singular once we find out what sin singular is, this is what's causing the sins. 
is an act. See, Jesus, and I'll, I'll share this with you. I'm going to listen. I want you guys to listen carefully to what I'm saying. Jesus cannot forgive sin. Now, for some of you, think, what does that mean? <laughs> but he does forgive sinners. Now, Jesus forgives the sinner who committed the sin, but he cannot forgive sin. That's the reason why he died. Because sin is the root of all this. Now, all those who are infected by these sins, if they make the right decision, then they can uh, come to Jesus. Then Jesus forgives the sinner. Now, for those who don't know, like I said, I, I kind of broke it down here. It's living life apart from God. And like what I said, this is the Old Testament thing. Uh, sin is sin. Sin is a state of being or behavior. And I said, no, sin is a state of being. It leads to uh, your behavior, what you do. So sin is sins. So the result, again, sin, singular is the cause, leads to sins, plural is the result. Uh, so I call that behavior, behavior, state of being, state of being. Now I, I have reversed that and I said, the state of being, this is what, because of here, because you have lived life apart from God, it leads to all the bad things you do. And I also stated that that's also, that violates the two principles of the law that you do. So uh, I know I kind of went kind of fast this morning, but uh, forgive me. I, I, yeah, kind of help out your question. Yeah, yeah thank uh, you so much. So basically our sins is what will lead us to sin, right? Correct. Okay, and the, um, the ultimate sin between these two sins is the separation from God. Yes, that is sin singular. Thank it's separating from God. Awesome. Which leads to our sins, all the bad okay, things you cool. do. And okay. Thank you so much. All right. Yeah. Okay, anyone else has a question? I know I still got a few minutes for anybody that wants to... Like what I said, the understanding of this topic could be a slight crack in the sidewalk or it could be like a big earthquake break in the road. Uh, not understanding it will mix you up. Huh? Thank you, Pastor Mai. Okay. Yeah. If there's no more questions this morning, going once, going twice. Okay. I do thank you guys for joining us here in our Sabbath school uh, morning. Uh, my prayer is that you guys continue to learn more about who God is. And this morning, I just want to say, uh, don't listen to really what I've said this morning, but go and study for yourself and see what you find out. And I pray the Lord that your study may come out fruitful and that your study will be uh, founded on Jesus Christ, who is our Savior and who is the, the God of all gods, who is Jehovah God this morning. So with that, <coughs> I'm sorry, y'all bow your heads and I'll close us off with a prayer this morning. Our dear grace, Heavenly Father, Lord, we're so thankful this morning. Father, as we have discussed what sin is in our lives, Father, we find that right in the middle of it, Father, is that sin is missing you, Lord. And we pray, Lord, that as we shoot for the mark, the mark is you, Father, that we focus on you and that all that you have died for will come into fruition in life. That we have fulfilled the love and not the lust of the flesh. Thank you, Lord, for all that you've done for us. Bless all of our hearers. Bless those who have joined us this Sabbath morning. And Lord, we just pray that you continue to be with us with the hours of the, of, of the Sabbath. And bless the sermon prepared by Pastor Willie Jr. Thank you, Lord, this morning. In Jesus' first name we pray. Amen. Thank you again this morning. And God bless us all this morning for joining us this morning. Uh, give us the...
God is good. And all the time, if you can just give me a thumbs up, thumbs up if you can hear me, or just say amen. Amen. So I'd like to ask you if you can, uh, there'll be times when I'm going to ask you to unmute and mute. And that way uh, we're doing a live recording. So I ask you to please be humble with the message as we continue with the scriptures and found in 1 Kings chapter 18. 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 16 to 38. God is good. We are not going to read every verse, but this verse is very important in the scripture. 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 16. I'm going to go back a few verses just to have a, a, a big, uh, a, a bigger picture of the story. It's talking about Elijah and um, Ahab. Ahab was one of the, well, one of the worst kings that was running the, the kingdom, and Elijah didn't like what he was doing, so he brought a drought. It's amazing because he didn't ask God what shall he do. He just saw something wrong, what they were doing. He brought a drought, and God allowed him to have that drought in the kingdoms. And so Ahab was after uh, the prophet Elijah. But there was a man named Obadiah who was actually under Ahab, but he didn't like what Ahab was doing, killing all the prophets of God. And so he hid, uh, I think, over a hundred a hundred uh, of prophets of God and, and while he was still under the king, the king of Ahab. And this is what happened when he had to meet. So a just listen to Ahab was looking for Elijah. Obadiah was one of the men that was a believer of God in respect of, of Elijah, but he was still under the realm of the king Ahab. Verse 7, it says this, As Obadiah was walking along, Elijah met him. Obadiah recognized him bowed down to the ground and said, it is really you, my Lord, Elijah. It is really you, my, my what? What did he call Elijah? Lord. And verse 11, it says, but now you tell me to go to my master and say, Elijah is here. So Obadiah was shocked that he saw Elijah and he says, it's really you, my Lord. And as they were talking, he wanted to face Ahab. So he said, go tell your master that I am here. Elijah is here. The reason why I want to bring this very point before I continue with the message is because he said, Lord and Master. He called Elijah Lord, and Elijah says, go tell your master. So this tells me that Obadiah had a Lord and a Master. I want to tell you right now that you may have a Lord, but who are you serving as a Master? Can we all say amen? Now let's continue to the story. Amen. Verse 16, it says, so Obadiah went to meet Ahab and told him, and Ahab went to meet Elijah. And it came to pass, when Ahab saw Elijah, that Ahab said unto him, Art thou he that troubled Israel? And he answered, I have not troubled Israel, but thou and thy father's house, and that ye have forsaken the commandments of the Lord. And thou hast fallen Balaam, follow Balaam. Now therefore send and gather to me all Israel out unto Mount Carmel and the prophets of Baal 450 and the prophets of Groves 400, uh, 400 which eat at Jezebel's table. 450 prophets uh, and 400 uh, prophets of Groves. So that's 850 prophets. Amen. 850 prophets, he wanted to meet all of them. Just one prophet against 850 prophets. Verse 20, let's read. So Ahab sent unto the, all the children of Israel and gathered the prophets together unto Mount Carmel. And Elijah came unto all the people and said, God's people, how long had ye between two opinions? How many opinions? Two opinions. The Lord be God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. And the people answered him not a word. These are God's people that couldn't even answer, a couldn't give a response to Elijah. Who should they follow? Can we all say amen? Verse 24, and call ye on the name of your gods, and I will call on the names of the Lord, and the God that answered by fire. So what happened is he's told the, all those prophets, he says, grab two bullocks, you pick one, and I'll pick the other one. Or you picked one, and the one you picked, the one that's left over, I will pick that one. And we'll throw it onto the altar. There was two altars, and they threw on one the altar, and he said, and call ye the name of your gods, and I will call on the name of the Lord. And the 
and a God that answered by fire, let him be God. Amen. And all the people answered and said, it is well spoken. And Elijah said unto the prophets of Baal, choose you one bullock for yourself and dress it first. For you are many and call on the name of your gods, but put no fire under. Hear me, O Lord, hear me, that this people may know that thou art the Lord thy God and that thou hast turned their heart back again. They, oh, let, let me say this again. And that thou hast turned their heart back again. Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt off burnt sacrifice and the wood and the stones and the dust and licked up the waters that was in the trench. Licked up the waters that was in the trench because he he threw four barrels of water onto the onto his altar to wet it to soak the the sacrifice wet and, and water. And when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces. They said, "The Lord, He is the God. The Lord, He." He is the, the God. Can we all say amen? The reason why I said it like that is not because I was messing up with my reading. Is that they just saw fire come down. And that's how they, I believe, how they reacted. The Lord, he is the God. The Lord, he is the God. That was a good comeback, yeah? Let us pray. Gracious Lord, Heavenly Father, thank you, God, so much for your love. Thank you, God, so much for your guidance. I ask you, Father, to please be with us, be with us with this message, to empower us to be the next, uh, empower us, uh, empower our faith to move to the next dimension. Give us the strength, Father God, as we're going through a crazy time right now. Laws and freedoms has been changed. And we ask you, Father, for you are the God of God and the King of all kings. Help us to be that man that, and woman that we need to be at the end times. In Jesus' name we all say, amen. The message today is called the inner beast. The inner beast. Now I want you to unmute your mics and repeat after me. And look at everybody on the screen and say, you look like a beast. Now, you're probably saying, that's pretty negative, Wooly. But wait a minute. You don't know what beast I'm talking about, amen? The inner beast. Now, before we can actually understand the true meaning, uh, I believe, with the story about Elijah, we have to understand about the Israel people, why they didn't have an answer to choose Baal or God. They didn't re reply. It's because they were fighting with themselves. And we got to see, see, I totally, totally believe this, is that the time with, with the Israels and Elijah, they were going through the same situation that we're going through, decisions. Who are we feeding? What is this inner beast that I'm talking about? Now, if we look the, in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 54, in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 54, can we please read? So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? Paul was saying this because he was on beast mode. Can we all say amen? O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? I'm going to say this again because I want this to really empower you. If you forget any of the message that I'm sharing you today, remember these lines. Oh, death, where is thy sting? Oh, grave, where is thy victory? The next verse I want to share with you in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16. It says, Know ye not that you are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. You are the what? The temple of God. So to truly understand why the Israels didn't respond to Elijah, I mean, who would you choose, Baal or God? And they didn't have an answer. There were 850 prophets that, was, that worshipped Baal and ate at the table of Jezebel. They were standing there and one prophet. So I want you to picture yourself as part of that, the people of Israel. They're standing and looking at 850 prophets and one prophet saying, who will you stand for? I believe they were afraid. 
to stand for what is right. After everything they've been through of God, they were still afraid. We are the temple of God. In the time of Israel, that is a sanctuary, my brothers and sisters. It was a sanctuary. Everything in the sanctuary represents Jesus Christ. The sacrificial altar, the labor, everything, the experience that he went through, the word, the manna, the 12 shoe birds, the, the, the seven candlesticks, he is the light of the world, the altar of incense, where our prayers go to heaven through the, uh, as the Holy Spirit being that connection between heaven and earth. My brother, everything in the sanctuary is about Jesus. And because that's the physical sanctuary, listen to this. It's the physical sanctuary in the Old Testament. And now because that's all Jesus Christ, now he says we are the sanctuary. Can we all say amen? That means Jesus Christ dwells within us. The spirit of God dwells within us. Every, every vessel that was in the Old Testament is, should be in us. Amen? Now listen to this. The sacrificial altar. If you're actually wondering, Lord, I, Lord, I, 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 I'm probably like those Israels. Like I know about you, God. I, 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 I try and pray. I'm having this issue of praying. I don't know how to talk to you, but I understand that that um, that you are God. But there's this this is there's this gulf between between you and me. I don't know how to get over. And, and I need to understand why am I like this? I know the truth. I know God, but why am I still going through these ways? Well, you got to understand a sanctuary, a temple of God has a sacrificial altar. If you want to understand the true essence of God in your relationship, you got to understand sacrifice. Oh, praise God. Sacrifice. 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 If once you start to take out the eye out of your life and put in God, amen, once you start to, start to take uh, uh, the light out of your, your life and put the light on Jesus Christ, my brother and sister, you understand sacrifice. Sacrifice is something that you dwell yourself upon. You can be your sacrifice, amen. I mean, how many of us, when, when you get married, then people say they get married because they want to be happy. That is such a lie. No one gets married because they want to be happy. <laughs> I mean, don't get me wrong. You, we want to be happy in our marriage, but you don't, get, you don't get married because you're happy. The reason why a lot of people get married, I believe, is because they understand the sacrifice of the I in replace of the we. Can we all say amen? We made a sacrifice of the I so that now it's no longer I, but it's we in the marriage. As a parent, it's no longer me, but it's my kids. There's a sacrifice. And once you start to go back to the old ways and put the eye back in, then there's a corruption. There's a conflict in marriage. There's a conflict being a parent because it's not about you anymore. Well, Willie, how do I know that I'm just an I? Well, if your password is your name, <laughs> if you look in your gallery or social media and all the pictures, it's just you. Sometimes in order for you to see God, you have to let go of the light and shine it on him and not yourself. Your passion is the evidence that God has given you what your heart desires. Listen to this. In Ephesians chapter, in Psalms 37 verse 4 to 5, it says, Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thy heart. Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. Commit thy way unto the Lord. Trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. He shall give people, a lot of theologians, even me at one time, I, I thought this like, wow, this is amazing. If I commit myself to God, he's going to give me all the desires that I, I have in my heart. But we got it all wrong. Amen. We got it all wrong. God does not give you the desires of your heart. God gives you desires in your heart. Let me prove, I, I, can, I can prove this in one, one situation, one experience in my life. When I first heard about Christ, I started to listen to Christ. And then I started to realize I needed Christ. Those missions that we go to, I needed Christ. And, now Christ. and when I started listening and hearing, he started putting a desire of himself in me. And that's why I wanted to get baptized. Because I had the desire. He placed the desire in me. And I had the passion to go and speak to him, to go and get baptized. Amen. Your passion is evidence that God has given you what your heart desires. If you want to know how to get closer to God, then find the passion. 
Passion is the evidence that God has implemented. See, God, God needs to get close to your spirit. But he can't when you're like, I, this, I, 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 <laughs> oh, I, I. You know, Lucifer had a lot of eyes too. In Isaiah 14, 31, he said the five eyes. I, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the side of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. I will. I will. I will. My brothers and sisters, when you start removing the I in your life and put God, you will go back to that passion. I totally believe it. But you got to take you out of the center seat of your decision making. Can we all say hallelujah? When you face a challenge, be the best you. God is good? And all the time? Ephesians 6 verse 18, it says, Praying always with all prayer and supplication, and the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. So when we pray to God, we pray in the Spirit. Can we all say amen? See, we got to understand something. We, God, when we speak to God, we speak in the spirit. We don't speak in the flesh because he works in a realm, in the spirit realm. So we have to empower the spirit to speak to God in the spirit, not in the flesh. So, we, so when you get baptized and people say, oh, I'm a newborn child, they're talking about the spirit has been renewed, not your flesh. You're still ugly. Amen. <laughs> I'm just playing. And it's not talking about your flesh. You're not, you're not a new child in the fleshly, physical body, but you are a new child in the spirit body. Hey, can we all say amen? In the spiritual realm, excuse me, in the spiritual realm. So you renew your spirit with God because when you speak to God, you have to speak with the spirit. And let me tell you something, my brothers and sisters, and don't get me wrong with this, but can I just bring it a little deeper? See, we were born in the flesh. But we are also born in the spirit. And for us to conquer our flesh, we have to start making decisions in the spirit. So we have to speak to God in the spirit. But a lot of us Christians, and I say Christian, is that sometimes when we come to church, we come in the flesh. Don't get me wrong, because there are some people that just brings the flesh out of you. Or let me say, sometimes they bring the wrong beast out of you. Amen. And how holy, holy we can be, we just, sometimes we want to go to work and slap that woman that always gets on your nerve. Or slap that, that brother that gets on your nerve, amen. I know a lot of times my sisters wants to slap me, but they won't. You know why? Because of these guns. <laughs> Here's what I'm sharing with you. I, when the Bible, and Exodus talks about when they were building the sanctuary, they started with, in the holy place, they started with the shoe bread, and then, they, and then they went to the seven candlesticks, and then they went to the altar of incense. They started with the shoe bread. We need to understand his word. We can't preach the light if you don't understand what he's talking about. And then you go and start sharing the light of, the light of God. And then you keep praying every day, my brothers and sisters. See, the prayer, the altar of incense is beautiful because the altar of incense needs an incense and a fire to ignite the smoke. And the smoke represents our prayers going towards heaven. So in another sense, for us, for our prayers to go to heaven as a smoke, we need fire. Oh, amen. We need fire and we need that incense to light that fire. My brothers and sisters, we need to start smoking up this church, eh? This church needs to go up and smoke. We need to choke our demons with the smoke. Now, <laughs> I don't know why, but somehow my, the flesh is telling me, Willie Jr., don't say that. A lot of them are thinking cigarettes. Now, I'm talking about a spiritual smoke. The smoke that goes to heaven that represents our prayers. In order for us to keep working with God and, and getting our best you, because a lot of us were like this. No, no, Willie, I don't want to be fake. I don't want to come to church and smile at somebody and, and then next minute uh, and I have something against that person. I don't want to be fake. I'm not asking you to be fake. I'm asking you to use the better you, the best you. Amen. Because you can be the best you and still not be fake. Hallelujah. <laughs> When you face a challenge, be the best you. 
God is good. And the Ark of the Covenant is what I believe the three things that's in the furniture. The rod of Aaron with that bear fruits. Where Jesus says he is the vine. Oh, amen. Jesus, he is the vine and we are the branches. And the manna that came down represents his word. And then the Ten Commandments represents his character. Wait a minute. The three truths and the Ark of the Covenant. I want to show you something. The six steps that I believe I used unknowingly, and I want to share with you to, sh to show you where to, to, you can ask yourself where you're at in your relationship with God. Here are the six steps. The first is self-sacrifice. You know, a lot of us keep asking for God, you know, Lord, I want to do this. I want to, I need your help for something, but can you help me? See, God will not answer your prayers unless he knows he has a purpose with the blessing he's going to give you. He will give you a resource for, that you need, but he will use it for his own purpose in you. So stop asking God to help you in your sports when you're in a game. Stop asking God, you know, Lord, you know, that some people, they go, they pray, God, please, Lord, let us win this game today. Let us, thank you, God, for, why you, you think God has time to worry about a game? When there's a bigger game involved, amen? You know, my cousin Ben, years ago, I caught him praying at one time when he was in his boxing, boxing prime time. And he was praying, and I asked him, why are you praying? He goes, I'm asking God to pray to please do not let me injure the other opponent really bad. You know, when was the last time you prayed for someone that hurt you? When was the last time you prayed and just said, thank you, God? You know, prayer is not just keep asking and asking and taking and taking. You know, a lot of us, we have people in our families that just take, 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 take take but they don't have the essence to give and it's okay to say no now and then because the more they take you the more you get warned out amen yeah listen to this it's okay to say no because the more they keep taking the more you get warned out the self-sacrifice if you want to know the passion of God, the desire that he will imp implement into your life, you got to understand sacrifice. There's no more I. Purity. You understand the, the Baptist, why it's important. God's word, God's light, his open communion with you. And the law to safeguard peace, mercy, to redeem in case of sin. So here's my six steps in a relationship with God. Self-sacrifice. How pure are you? Are you giving your best you? Are you reading God's word? Are you sharing the light? Are you praying to God daily? It is an open communion. Are you keeping God's law, his commandments, to remind you what sin is? If you're not in any of these levels, then stop wasting your prayers to God stop wasting his time I may I'm sorry I'm being blunt with you but this is a tough world this is a tough situation that we're in and if you're asking questions how am I need to pray well first of all ask yourself where are you here you can hear God's word every day but if you're not understanding a sacrifice you will never feel the, the passion and the desire that God wants to implement in your life sacrifice is your first step in a relationship with God anything you don't anything you don't allow the Holy Spirit to kill will eventually kill you anything you don't allow the Holy Spirit to kill will eventually kill you this is why I totally believe that the, the Israelites couldn't have a response because they were afraid they saw 850 prophets and one prophet said come unto God but they didn't want to say anything because they didn't understand sacrifice they didn't understand to give it their best you to present themselves with their best you I have a worse me don't get me wrong I have a worse me but I'm presenting my best me it's not me being fake it's me being mature it's me being the better me that and I need to be in front of God. So I don't care what any, people can call me fake. People can call me this, but God knows this is the best me. You don't want to know me, the old me. Oh, hallelujah. 
You don't want to see that. And I don't want to see him. I'm sick and tired of taking the old me off the cross. And so Elijah just stood there and he told these prophets, pray unto your God with fire. And they were praying till evening, from morning till evening, and nothing happened. And then the beast came out of Elijah. <laughs> the beast came out of Elijah and he started mocking them. He goes, cry louder. He probably can't hear you. He's probably having a cup of tea. He's probably in the store buying something. He's probably busy taking selfies. <laughs> Cry louder so he can hear you. And they got so upset that they even cut themselves. They cut themselves so deep asking for, asking for their gods to bring fire to their sacrificial altar. And nothing happened. And Elijah, the beast came out of him. He goes, you know what? Get some barrels of water. Pour it, soak in wet. And let me pray. So he got on his knees. And he prayed. He prayed. And fire came down. Can we all say amen? Uh, I think you missed it. I think this needs a big amen for this. He prayed and fire came down on the altar and it licked up all the water and burned everything on top of the altar. Everything. The water was dissolved and, and the, the, the sacrificial altar was burnt up. Fire came down. Fire came down on the altar. There were two altars, and one was soaked with water four times. The other one was not, and fire came down on this one because Elijah was praying to the God, but this one wasn't. I want to put this in a point where we, where I can understand the story, is that these altars is me. I've been baptized so many times, I lost count how many times I've been baptized. But I'm praying because I want to be right with God. So I'm praying and I'm praying and God has given me the spirit to keep moving forward and he implements a desire in my heart so that I will have the passion to keep moving forward even though I'm going through my struggle I have the passion it's the evidence that God knows that he still has a purpose in my life can I say this again I have been praying I have got the spirit of God and because my spirit is close with Jesus Christ he has implemented desire in my life that gives me the passion to give keep moving forward so it doesn't matter what situation that I'm going in going through I know that God still has a purpose in my life but we have the sick and altar that's me too and it didn't go on fire but I have 850 prophets magnifying this sacrificial altar that has nothing to do with God and it didn't work the question is my brothers and sisters which beast are you feeding Which beast mode is coming out? Who are you today? Jesus was in beast mode. He was kind. He was humble. But when he saw something wrong in his church, he started throwing everything wrong. Right now, I believe us Christians right now, we need to be in beast mode for God. We need to stand for what is right for God. Enough excuses. Stop making excuses. Stop feeling sorry for yourself. Everybody's going through suffering. Everybody's going through financial struggle and struggles in relationship and with themselves. Everybody, you're not, you're not different from everybody else. I'm sorry to say this. You are not that special to, to Satan. Satan has the same wickedness that he's implemented to everybody else. We need to stop making excuses. So let's be humble. Amen. Let's be kind. Let's be small. Let's be humble. Let's be kind. And let's be small. Let us pray. Gracious Lord, Heavenly Father, thank you God so much for your love. 
and for an understanding that we need to stand for what is right no matter what. Whatever gods that we're magnifying in our life, whether it's self, relationship, a job, or even a phone. Nowadays, my, brother, my brothers and sisters, my children, they're on their phone 24-7. I miss the good old times. When I was young with my mom and dad, brothers and sisters, laughing, cheering in the front, I miss those times. But we're in a new age, my life, and we are hypnotized by the government's media, everything that is happening, Father God. We need to be in beast mode. There's a time to cry. There's a time to laugh. There's a time to, to, to stand for the truth, and now it's the time. Our inner beast needs to come out. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much for joining us. May God be with you. God bless you in your path. And I pray that God will help you to bring the right beast that comes out of you, amen. That inner beast, especially now times, um, we are going through some, some crazy changes. And things are haven't even happened. This is nothing compared to what's going to happen soon. And if you do have time, please join me on Wednesday. I have a Zoom as well. But until then, thank you so much for joining in. God bless you. May the Lord be with you. In Jesus' name, amen.